Hi, everybody, and welcome. This is the Apostate Prophet. I hope you're having a fantastic day. Uh, Yasmin Mohammed and I have recently talked and agreed that we should host a series of conversations with people that are, in a way, survivors of, um, of a very real form of Islam, who have uh, lived Islam through to a certain extent, who got married to, to, to people who were uh, Islamists or who were very serious Muslims, who have uh, lived in the Islamic world, who have lived with Islam, and uh, similarly, people who have uh, made their experience with Islam. Uh, Yasmin thought, and I thought, it would be very interesting and very significant to bring real life experiences to everybody instead of just uh, just me talking about these, these matters as I always do. And I thought it would really be an honor to have Yasmin here with me who uh, has made life experiences herself. Um, very serious life experiences, and has also written a book about that. We have our first guest today, Deborah. Uh, I don't want to talk too much uh, about this. I want to uh, give the word to Yasmin from here and tell, uh, let her tell us more about what we are going to do. Yasmin. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much, Radvan. I really appreciate you giving us a platform to have this conversation. I'm really excited about talking with Deb about her experience. Her and I have a lot of similarities. She's read my book and um, she felt that she lived a lot of the similar things that I lived through, even though obviously she's from a very different culture mm -hmm. than what I'm from, because that seems to be the, the common thing is, oh, that was just your culture. It has nothing to do with Islam. Um, so obviously we know that that's a fallacy, but Deb is here to talk to us about her experience in Islam that has absolutely nothing to do with her culture. Um, so what really interested me in inviting Deb to this conversation was learning that she was married to a member of Hezbo Tahrir, who was actually recruited by our friend Majid Nawaz. I'm sure Majid feels a lot of guilt about that and regrets it dearly. Um, but Deb, I'd like you to take us through the steps of how did that even happen? So start off with like young Deb before you even met him. Tell us a little bit about your childhood and then if you could launch into just meeting him for the first time and how you got wrapped up in this web. Right. Um, so my background is Mennonite. So my parents emigrated here. Um, so we're kind of first generation. We weren't raised uh, like the Mennonites, although my parents lived there without electricity and all that. Um, very religious, though. Um, we still like adhere to all the beliefs. So I grew up quite religious and like fearing hell and believing in heaven and all that. Um, I always had a lot of resentment towards the way they treated children and women in particular. And I didn't even know why, but because I was the only girl in my family, I have three brothers. <clears throat> I noticed just the different dynamic, just even in extended family, in my family. And um, it just, it was just the way it was. You just have to accept it. So to me, it was like, I didn't like it, but I didn't really know why. It's just, cause it's just the way. And, sounds like um, you were prepped to become a Muslim, because that sounds yeah, like me. Much. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Women have their place, the submissive wife, and you have your children, lots of children. And um, so um, as I became older, though, I wanted to go to Bible college so I could learn more about what you're putting your whole like life into. And it was in Bible college where I actually... Um, stopped believing in the Bible because I was taught like how it was actually compiled. Like it wasn't mm -hmm. a magic book. It was like, wow, they found all these things and somebody decided which ones to put in there and which ones not and let's adjust it. So that really just threw me off. I, I quit after a year and I kind of was atheist, more just like not Christian anymore, just not knowing much. Um, and do you so, mind if I interject for a second? How did, did your parents? Did you share with them that you had that your belief has been shaken, and how uh, did they react? Uh, they, um, the thing with you know, the thing with Mennonites is they really don't like education. So with Mennonites, they stop education at grade six. So they just blame my doubts on I just learned too much now. So it oh. was like nothing makes sense with you know just 
blind face. But they didn't respond to you in an aggressive no, manner like in any way. They didn't like it. They just thought, you know, she's going to come back around, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, I was, I guess, almost set up for, like, embracing Islam after that because, um, I mean, I was just, like, kind of lost and, and just wandering around trying to figure out and trying many things. And um, I was briefly married to an atheist, and we just – you know, it just didn't work. It was just like a, like a, like a practice marriage almost. Um, and then when I met uh, my ex, he was uh, giving talks at the local university, doing debates about the Iraq war because it was now when Bush was being reelected. So there was so much political like talk, everyone knows. So I found that of course fascinating because here like he's so educated and the thing with this group is everybody is the same. Like they all speak the same. They all like, you can tell if somebody's a member, they all have the same way of speaking. Um, they're well uh, educated. They're, they're just um, trained to look at Islam intellectually. So now you're not approaching it like a religion. It's not just some religion. You're actually taking current events that are happening and now we're analyzing it in the right way. Like, the West is doing this to the countries, and this is why the Muslims are reacting this way. So basically, you're taught or, or told that ever since, um, I guess, the end of World War I, when the West destroyed the Hilafa and broke up everything into small countries, um, it's just been an endless campaign to prevent the Hilafa from ever coming back. So when you take it that way, you can kind of twist every event to kind of, you know what I'm saying? Go that way? Yes, I am. And so the Hizb tahrir are a group of Islamists similar to the Muslim Brotherhood, and their aim is to what? Their aim is to reestablish the Islamic State. Their only difference okay. from other groups is that it's through nonviolence. Their way is just, we're just spreading ideas, and ultimately they really like want to find a big army like Pakistan or somebody which they really think is, they're pretty religious, I guess, get a whole army to now stage a coup. And that's how they plan on taking over a country and starting up the Islamic state. Now, like when places like ISIS and there's like always small little hilafas that pop up here and there. Um, it's just us as the Hizb would never, um, go and move there and support it because they didn't do it through the right method like the they way did it did through violence yeah, yeah exactly and it's so like so laid out like they have like hundreds of books like to go yeah. through and they have like a full constitution written out ready mm -hmm. to go a full economic system ready and to all go. of this is transparent it's ready, They're ready, not hiding like, this. instant it's right there you can just i just mm -hmm. like looking it up you mm -hmm. can so they're just waiting for like the second they can get in like they have everything so mm -hmm. for people's clarification, um, so it, it is the same issue. The end goal is the same. They want to establish an Islamic caliphate, just like exactly. uh, like other violent organizations. Yeah, but the just... only difference is that they say uh, we shouldn't do, we shouldn't initially do this with more violence. We should do this uh, politically and intellectually in order to then establish a violent caliphate. That's correct. Yeah. So That's... was this the conversation he was having at the university that attracted you to him? <laughs> Um, no, it was, no, it was more like because I was against the war. I was like very liberal, like, very liberal. So you're like, you know, what are we doing? Like we're hurting these people, and they're just so peaceful, and um, you know, the whole 9/11 conspiracy. It's just you know, it just makes more sense. And then off also, so uh, he's not. He's not when he's having these talks in the university. He's not actively saying that he wants to make an Islamic caliphate. He's instead coming at it from things that he knows that you'll relate to and that people in like basically liberal, Western liberals, things that they will relate to and appreciate. And, you know, yeah. it's kind of like in Egypt, we call that Sidma Falasa. That's what the Muslim Brotherhood did. They pretend to be your friend by building schools and building hospitals and saying what they think you want to hear. Yeah. But in actuality, they're trying to establish a caliphate they're trying to to spread their message and create what they want to create but you know someone like linda sarsour is a perfect example right, right. she'll use the left progressive speech um, to get herself 
just basically her tentacles into, um, you know, she's, there's a video of her talking about an American, new American Congress person that just got elected. And she's like, he's going to need to listen, just sit down and pay attention. And what we tell him to do, he's just going to have to do it. And she's just saying this on a video, like they're very transparent about what they want and, and how they, you know, what their aims, what their goals are, but they do it in a very um, subversive way. So when he was doing these talks, you were hearing him talk about peace and love and, you know, we don't want to have um, so wars much. with the Iraqis. Okay. Right. It was, but, and they don't really hide what their goals are either, but they present it in a way that um, it's the ultimate solution. Like all of our problems here in the West, like That's women being scary. raped all the time and ugh, everything, homelessness, uh, all any, every problem that you can think of. Islam has like a beautiful solution. And if, if only everyone would do it, it would be perfect. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, I guess the issue with Hizbut Tahrir is that, is that, um, more than sugarcoating like many other groups that we see. For example, uh, I just want to bring up an, an example from myself. I grew up within a um, a movement, an Islamic movement that from the outside looks extremely peaceful. You know, like uh, we are in Europe, for example, and in Europe we would be called just a, um, a peaceful, very religious uh, group that sticks to itself. But in, inside we would spiritual. learn that... Spiritual. Yeah, spiritual. spiritual. More spiritual yeah. than yeah. political. But and we would learn about the, the love of Allah and, and, mm -hmm. and, and how to get closer to him through suffering and, and all kinds of uh, nonsense like that. But uh, inside, we also learn very politically that uh, the only reason we are not fighting right now is that the time hasn't come and the circumstances haven't been uh, been set, haven't been met yet. So uh, we just need to uh, to to hold wait. on to our faith and uh, wait for the, 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 the circumstances to arise so that we can take up the... the you know the with the weapons the arms that can the go Sufis to war we're also ready to fight no they are they are very much so is it the Ahmadis that are the only ones that kind of removed all the jihad out of there or i would, I would even say it's not even fundamentally f to them uh a quality yeah. to be necessarily peaceful That's it's just funny. also a a means a bridge to them in a way wow. uh, but but with, with his book we have it's like they are more more open about how um, an Islamic caliphate needs to be established, but they are, uh, but they are more, more, more. They just, they just approach. They try, just try to approach it very so, reasonably. Right. So they do many talks to in mosques and uh, to Muslims to explain how the Prophet um, did it, how he brought about the Islamic State, and they try to emulate that exact. So like um, we did this, right. and then we well, do this. So it's spreading of ideas first, and then we do this, and they're basically like we're and the the happens because that's how the prophet did it. Yep. Mm. So that's how the because that's how they got their method. They're like because we're doing it the right way because so then if we do it this way, then it will be the right khilafa, like the real mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, take me back to you, um, a young girl going into a university auditorium and hearing a charismatic man speaking. Tell, talk to me about how your relationship evolved. So I met him and I was attracted to him. And um, he basically, um, I don't know, it was just like, we liked each other and he and he started saying with Islam, like there's no dating and you know if you want to marry me we could like and it was just like more like Ooh, he wants to marry me like right now it was like you know that whole like funny but uh seriously i was just like well you know that's interesting and i will go look into it because i didn't really know much about the religion itself so um i had his like email and stuff and it was like I forget what message, whatever messenger we used to use back then. But when I went and researched Islam, it was uh, basically all the problems I had with Christianity. It was like they had the answer for all of them. So it was just kind of like, wow. So it was easy. And so when I told him, uh, it was just, you know, well, you're a Muslim now. I said the Shahada and he was like, let's get married for real. And then I moved to another city, which was far from where I was. So I right away uh, was segregated and I could yeah. start, like change my life 
drastically without any problems because now I'm among really religious Muslims only. Separated from your friends and family yeah. and community. And then I we didn't tell anybody. I, I was terrified to tell my family. How much yeah. did you know about that before that happened? Like how Sorry? much did you know how much did you know that your life would change that much that drastically before it no. actually happened? I so in my mind, um so it sounds insane I'm like get up and move and marry this guy. In my mind it was okay, so I'm just gonna go basically move in with this guy I like and have this like religious wedding and if it doesn't work out i'll just move out it was, so it was kind of like i'm just kind of moving with a guy yeah, in my mind, it was kind of like not so crazy in that way yeah and another way i was going to finally like learn about this new religion i just joined as well so and he well i mean <clears throat> it was like strange we had a wedding in his friend's house and it was strange, like this. Uh, it was a segregated men and women in separate places. Yeah, it was segregated. The sister came to sit with me, and she was like, she was like just beaming at how amazing I was that I accepted this religion. And she was so young and innocent, and and I was just like, I didn't know what to do. It was. It took hours, so I was so exhausted by the end of it. I didn't know what was going on. <clears throat> it was. Um, these strange traditions and rituals. And then his friend, I guess you have to have a mahram. To, and if your dad isn't there, they he picks one for you. So this so guy, I didn't know. It's not there because you didn't tell them? I didn't tell anybody. Mm -hmm. Just so, a clarification, Mahram is um, so a, a guardian of a, of a woman. Yeah, um, so this guy was almost acting as my father to give me away to him. So. I met him and it was really awkward. And and then he explained to me too, he goes, do you know that he's part of this group that could possibly land him in jail one day? So he did give me that because he was also in this group and everybody there was also in this group actually, the, everybody that was there. So I was like, oh, okay. Like, Cause I knew that, like I went to these things, I already heard the stuff. And uh, to me, I'm just like, yeah, you know, like it's nonviolent though. so. Mm. They, they're not violent they just talk so it, it was you know again you can justify it again they're peaceful they're not violent so at that point you didn't know that their aim was to eventually be violent but they're just going to be peaceful at the beginning you didn't know that yet right. and so when you think of that you just think well that's really something that will just never happen like in right. my lifetime it's just like you know it's let's never happen you know and then the not without my daughter thing you know that's just an exaggeration and propaganda against this religion again and so you just you go in totally rejecting any warnings or red flags that you would have even seen so um again i just i don't understand why um this religion in particular is so defended when mm -hmm so many things that break laws and uh, human rights like all the time that's the question i think it's really important for you especially to be speaking out right now though because i have so many women that write to me that are like you born and raised somewhere in the west have not ever been muslim or exposed to islam and that are caught up in love with some man yep. who does not share the truth with them. And they do kind of sense these little red flags, but they're denying them because they love him and because he's telling her it's gonna be okay and it's gonna be different for her. And the, the, the line that they always love to tell women like you is, Muslim men are allowed to marry non-Muslim women. So you're under no obligation to do to convert. That's yeah. another thing. Again, that was another thing. It's like I don't have to do it. But of yeah, course, meanwhile, like I was it later. wearing all black abaya and hijab and sleeves and pants and everything uh within a day. <laughs> and it was just like basically head first into that lifestyle and praying and, and learning Arabic. And so you're so caught up in learning all the rituals and learning this language that you've never seen before even. Um, you can't even think um, about anything else anymore. And I got pregnant right away. Oh. So then 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. We were like, okay, now we got to take this seriously. Like, okay, we're mm-hmm. pregnant. So then I wasn't eat. So that throwaway boyfriend thing is gone now. So now I'm going to take this seriously and now adhere to this religion seriously. So I kind of bought into it at that point. Um, but then, you know, with being pregnant and after that I was pregnant and breastfeeding for the next 10 years straight, like, non-stop it was just so you get that on top of everything else i had like no sleep for like 10 years so you, you, you don't even have to have the the option to to go back i mean at the first at first it is just you just want to explore right. something so because it's, it seems exciting but then right. you're right into it and there is no going back anymore because right. you're too yeah. deep into it do you think it's it has to do with um i mean it's, it's kind of a uh i don't know if if, if uh, it's kind of a cliche, but there is a lot of truth to it, I would say. But do you think it has um, you finding yourself in that relationship and being attracted to Islam, to an Islamist uh, person? Do you think that has uh, a little bit something to do with your background? The fact that you have, uh, you know, left the Mennonite background behind and you, you, you started seeking, you were like in kind of a... Um, it's familiar. Yeah, yeah like oh, it was, it yeah. was a, a sort of rebellion, oh, yeah, but also something like- familiar you feel like when when you feel so lost when especially with islam like every single thing is dictated to you so that is like comforting when you know even with christianity if you're trying to be very religious like you there's so much open to ter- interpretation you're still not sure if you're doing the right thing like to me when i was in bible college I really thought mother teresa was like the epitome of what cr- the bible tells you to be I was like, if you really want to be that person. So Islam, it, it was comforting to me that like, if you want to be a Muslim, it, you do all these things and it's like easy. Like, how do you breathe? How do you eat? How do you, yeah. like even just going to somebody's house, if you look in their window, you get these insane punishment of like, what's it, it's as if the whole house comes down on you. If you look into somebody's house, like things like that. So when things like that are constantly going through your mind. You have no time to think. Your brain yeah. Yeah, you yeah. can't you're not objective anymore. You're really not. You're just a cyborg. You're just every single step of the day is laid out for you and you must step in this specific direction in this way, right foot yeah. first, right? There's yeah. never any opportunity for you to use your brain or to think or to interpret or to question. That's just not an option. Yeah. It's really hard to explain to somebody unless they've been in a cult. It's right. really hard for them to understand the, that indoctrination. Like, it'd be really difficult for them to understand how does a free woman like you get caught up in marry, being married to an Islamist and you know having child after child? Like, how how does that happen? It's a very slow boil, yeah. and it's when you're separated from everyone too. It's so easy when everyone's doing what you're doing. It's very easy. It's, yeah. As soon as you start, and that's where things got hard for me, is trying to live in the outside world at the same time. Yeah. That friction caused such a breakdown at the end that I just... That's why the interaction with the outside world as much as possible so that you don't have that. Right. And I was told by other sisters that, you know, and that's why women need to stay indoors. Yes. And, and that's... <laughs> the wisdom of Allah, wow. you know, why you should be indoors, like you shouldn't be out working or like what's wrong with you? Why are you talking to that man? You yeah, know, just that's why you have to not see there. anything, not hear anything, right. not leave the house, just like be completely separated, yeah. you know, might as well be six feet under because that way there will be no problems and there will be peace. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. So I when did you start? heaven's under the mother's feet so me staying home being a mother that's all i have to do like that's all i did have a lot of pressure to um do uh his work because the thing with the his is when you start working um and learning their um i guess you start taking a halakha and you don't become oh, a right circle. Away. sorry just yeah. if you could yeah it's tell people about what a halakha is a study group yeah okay but it's very official. And um, as soon as you start learning it, you have to start teaching it <clears throat> because that's how you learn the best. And mm-hmm. you're not allowed to write anything down. You have to take it all to memory. And you, you have to redo books over and over until you almost have it memorized, like their wording on exactly how to say it in their wording. 
And so again, so you have Islam's already their robotic way of doing things. This is the same idea and then, wow. in their way. And they have like weekly halakas that are two hours long and they're late at night always. And it's just. Are you guys joining the regular mosques like that I would have gone so to? They, yep. Yeah. So there are Sunni mosques. They will go to Sunni mosques only. Um, a lot, sometimes mosques will uh, kick them out if they find out that they're trying to do things there. So um, that's not where you had your halakas were not in a mosque? No, they're usually at somebody's house. Mm -hmm. um, no, so they will try to do um, Friday khutbahs a lot of times mm -hmm. um, to get into places. So they'll do khutbahs at uh, MSAs all the time mm -hmm. and different Islamic schools. Mm -hmm. um, you want to get exposure to all the youth that are fired up about the political situation. So when you get um, Muslim youth um, who's fired up, up about the wars that's going on, and then you have this group like the Hizb that has all of those concerns and then answers for them, it's very appealing to these young men, especially, that uh, want to do something. So a lot of recruitment going on in colleges and universities across Canada. I don't know if we mentioned that you're in Canada, yeah. but across Canada, across the US, we know from Majid across the UK, obviously yeah. all across Europe, so that's where they're going. They're going to colleges and universities, recruiting students in Muslim student associations. And then in your case, it wasn't even a Muslim student association where you heard him, you just heard him in a regular- No, he was just speaking uh -huh. there. And he was living in the town I was living in, so for just briefly. He had just moved from the UK, so he was- um, Is he still actively there. recruiting or speaking? Sorry? Is he still actively speaking and recruiting? Yes. Yeah. Well, that you have to, like you have, you have to, like if you're a member, like, and you're not doing anything, they'll kick you out. Like you are very obligated to work. Okay, I want to uh, quickly uh, clarify the the distinction um, or the significance of his tahrir. So, in in the Islamic community, uh, correct me if you want to add anything. If I if I miss anything, um, Muslims are traditionally obligated to establish in to establish Islamic law. So, yeah. as long as Muslims uh, exist in a community, they are supposed to follow Islamic law not only personally but also as a community. So, if right. they establish a state, a leadership, it has to be Islamic. Now, uh, many Muslim nations and communities today in the world still think that that, that that they should follow Islamic laws, even those, even many that live in uh, secular countries. So mm -hmm. on average, the majority of Muslims want to follow Islamic law. Uh, where the, the, the disagreement starts is that there is no caliphate nowadays, because the last caliphate was uh, destroyed uh, by the secular Turks in uh, at the beginning of the last century. But uh, groups like Hizbut Tahrir and many other groups, yeah, but groups like uh, Hezbollah Tahrir and many others uh, want to re-establish that caliphate again, because according to Islam, it is not only an obligation to establish Islamic law in, in an Islamic state, but it's also an obligation to declare a caliph and to follow that caliph, because Muslims, as long as they exist, are, according to Islamic scholarly consensus, obligated to have one leadership and uh, spread Islam under that leadership militarily and diplomatically and in every other way. So when groups like ISIS, for example, go out and want to um, establish this caliphate violently, groups like Hezbollah Tahrir want to establish this uh, this caliphate in a more intellectual or diplomatic way. But in the end, uh, what they want to do is to establish an Islamic caliphate, no matter how many groups there are, no matter how much they differ. And uh, the, the end result of that Islamic caliphate is, again, to go out there and to uh, continue the, the conquest of, uh, of the world and to spread yeah. Islam to every single person that is out there, exactly. as long as humans exist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Just so, to yeah, no, for sure, absolutely. Because when we say these kinds of things, Deb, people think that we are being Alex Jones about it. Mm -hmm. They think that we are exaggerating. They think that this is a conspiracy theory because they it's not their experience and they don't have any, you know, knowledge about it. They have no points of reference. And so it just sounds like crazy talk to them. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, um, yeah. But this is all, you know, like you said, it's 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 documented. It they're transparent about it. This is the first I've heard actually when you just mentioned that there are certain things that you can't write down. You can only speak about. And I suspect that's because you were in Canada and because they were afraid that the authorities might. Um, I just know it's a rule across the board. Like you can't mm -hmm. take notes ever for this. Like they'll give you their books. 
but that's it. Like you have your books. Interesting. I mean, I grew up in a similar community where it was um, a general rule where everyone knew the rule that uh, that certain things are only spoken, not not written down. Well, uh, it's, it's making sure you have it committed to memory and they yeah. test you on it. I mean, if you want to become a member, like you have the senior members, like really drilling you and making sure you answer the right way and are doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. I never became a member. I was being pressured to the whole time. I was just saying, look, I have, I'm having kids all the time. Like, how do I fit? And then if I have to start becoming a member, now I have to go find sisters to now do the same thing with. And they're all having babies. So I don't know how. It's like a pyramid scheme. You have to get <laughs> yeah. in it and then recruit others. And you have they to. Recruit and so others. the way they um, do, uh, I guess, the way they explain it to Muslims is that being a Muslim, we are only able to uh, practice a third of Islam um, without a khilafah. So mm -hmm. we're literally sinning right now mm -hmm. without mm -hmm. having one. So if we don't try to establish it, then we're sinful for not at least trying. Because a lot of Muslims, they're like, yeah, Allah says there will be a khilafah at the end. So they're just waiting for it to magically to happen. And so the hizab argues, no, we have to do something. Actively to make it happen. But that's another way to get people to this join. Is this is so strange. I, I don't know how to, I mean, how to uh, explain the details of this without, um, you know, without it sounding problematic, because there are certain other um, other groups that are active in our time that uh, very clearly teach that uh, as long as two people exist, or as long as two Muslims exist, they must declare uh, one of them a caliph, a, a caliph and right. then they must, and then they must violently uh, fight off any, anybody else who challenges that that claim. So it's kind of, um, it, it, it follows the same pattern that uh, right. although it is not violent, it is still an obligation. And as long as you don't do it, you are being sinful because you're not truly following the expectations of Islam and the obligations yeah. of it. So a military coup just leads to, it would just be insane violence right after that. Like it's just, just because they convinced some army to go ahead and do this for them. Mm -hmm it's going to become bloody instantly right after that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But they don't care. Like they, they adamantly defend all of the punishments that will come after the cutting the hand, the everything throwing gay people off of a cliff. Like everything is just, they're like, yeah, of course. Oh, and slavery, of course, but it's not, it's, it's merciful slavery. It's not the same as what we are taught in history. It's, you know, it's, it's when a lot of slaves like it, they're happy. Blood decrees it. It's merciful and wonderful. So, you know. I recently talked to an Islamist who said who said something like, uh, was really rationalizing here, sitting down with me, and who was saying, well, if you compare uh, the historical concept of wage labor, wage labor is actually the same as slavery. And actually, slavery is better because with a wage labor, uh, you just rent people, whereas with slavery, you own people, and yeah. you better take care of something that you own than what you rent. So that was the reasoning. <laughs> so... That, that's how we justify, justify Islamic slavery. By the way, you forgot to mention uh, the killing of apostates. I think we should always honor yeah, that yeah, one. That's another one. He actually literally did some talks about that because I think there was about five, six years ago, there was like an issue. They were, somebody killed an apostate in Afghanistan or something and it was worldwide news. So he went out and did some talks about it. And I had a big problem. I had many discussions with him about it because I still somebody you know Allah will take care of them you know like that's how why are we but then again well it's merciful because we will take him and talk to him and try to convince him first we're not just going to kill him well, yeah he has three him. days it's it's merciful yeah. it's like just like um prosecution in Islam like you need four witnesses in order to prosecute For or great women but four men <laughs> Yes. Yeah, it has to be man, of course. <clears throat> so I want to get into more of your personal story, but there's so much that I want to ask you about Hezbo Tahrir. Um, so before I, I get into like, you know, what was your relationship with your family? What was it like wearing hijab? When did you start to doubt? All of those things. I just want to ask one question that popped into my mind. So when I was growing up, I was taught that we shouldn't vote because we are living in a non-Muslim country and this is a non-Islamic government. So vote, they're a fake government. They're not real. They're not legitimate. It's They don't follow Sharia. So we shouldn't vote. Yeah. Was that similar for you with Hezb? That's 
they the same they're outside of the mosques like no voting no voting every time there's an election it's, yeah you're so it's interesting for a kuf, kufar to implement kufar that's what we were yes, told. exactly so exactly and i think that's an important thing for people to hear because politicians pander to muslims obviously you know this being a canadian how much they pander to muslims and it's like you're wasting your time buddy because they're not going to vote for you they're not going to vote for you because at the end of the day you're a kafir and this is the you know a government of kafar and so pander all you want they're going to get everything they want out of you and they're still not going to vote for your sorry ass um so just going to take it to a little bit of a Canadian context for just a little bit, because I don't know how many Canadian viewers we have that are interested, but this is something that would be across the board anyway, because Hezbo Tahrir are universal, like they're global. Yeah. And same thing with Muslim Brotherhood and other Islamist groups. But in the Canadian government, I have recently learned, not only do we have Islamists in our liberal government, but we have them in our conservative government as well. Yeah. Can you speak on that? Um, I noticed the last time I voted, actually, every single person on the ballot in every party was a Muslim. <laughs> it was like, I was looking, I'm like, wow. But to me, that meant nothing, because according to Hizb, that is completely useless. So I've never considered that to really impact anything until you and I had that, or we had that conversation recently about little things that can be changed through um, having Muslims in government where like these uh, Islamophobia laws um, or not being able to prosecute polygamy or um, anything. I mean, They're getting Mormons, what they don't Mormons get prosecuted for polygamy in Canada? Yeah, everybody does except for Muslims. Except Muslims. And I mean, I was part of polygamy. Um, I have so many friends that are in it and you tell the authorities and they're just like, so when you say you saw a bunch of Muslim names on the ballot and it didn't concern you, um, why why wouldn't it concern you that people that want to create a caliphate are getting themselves into the government of a secular country? How, why is that not concerning to you? Well, I was taught, like, uh, according to the Hizab's view, is that once you uh, basically sign up to a Kafir government, you've kind of sold out already. So you're ah. useless and you have no, you've no, like you'll have no influence. Like you're kind of like, you've basically sold your soul and you're like, so I guess I still just saw it that way. I'm like, eh, they think they can do something, but they there's nothing you can do. Uh, so when you say do something and when you say concerning, you're speaking about from the perspective of a Hezbo Tahrir woman. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. That's just the way now I we understand. Okay. Yeah. I thought I'm you were so speaking like that. Believe me. Okay. So as a Hezbo Tahrir woman, you're like, oh, well, they're never going to be able to establish yeah. the caliphate in Canada. Exactly. So that's not really useful. Exactly. Okay. It's not going to do anything. All right. But from their perspective, they may not necessarily, I think it's sort of it's the, in long the way game. that it's, it's, it's the long, long game. game. It's, it's like it's a con art. They play yeah. a long game. It's a very long game. But obviously, yeah. when the end goal is so glorious right yes yeah so it's yeah yeah so anyway let's bring it back to your personal story can you tell us about um what it was like for you putting hijab on you know how did your family react to that how was your relationship with them and with their grandkids um you know all that kind of stuff and then when did you start to doubt the religion um so i started wearing hijab pretty much right away um and I guess when you're, again, when you're among everyone that does the same thing as you, it's like, it's easy. Like, it's like, wow, this is like, so, you know, you, you're comparing your party to Mary, like Jesus's mother, like, wow, we're being so pious and we're praying all the time. And um, I mean, converts are so revered. I mean, I was even asked by like, an MSA in a university to start a women's uh, study group. So and I, I just for a second, MSA is a Muslim Student Association. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, I was uh, asked to speak once a week and teach them about Islam. <laughs> and I had just been Muslim for like a month. It was just, yeah. that's how great it was, how I was. Yeah. So you're riding this high. Um, I mean, I, I'm learning that my, you know, 
what this group is like kind of like a activist group so it's kind of exciting too so you get the, these liberal activists that are also part of this group so we go to these like rallies and stuff um, I just want to say something very quickly. I mean, you, you just mentioned how uh, you just converted to Islam and you were very revered as, as, a, as a convert and they uh, immediately wanted you to speak and to oh, speak yeah. to other Muslims about Islam and to teach Islam. It's, it's very funny to me. I, I often point this out, but uh, first off, uh, converts, especially white people, especially white women are, are extremely uh, revered in, in the Islamic community. If you are a convert, if you just converted, you are like, everybody's attention is on you. But another thing is, uh, when we, as people who have uh, lived and practiced Islam for, for decades, for so many years, come out and speak about Islam, the objection that we receive from the average Muslim is, well, uh, yeah, obviously, they don't know anything about Islam. They're completely <laughs> ignorant. They left for their desires yeah. and this and that. Yeah, but yet, yeah. when you convert to Islam, and even if you don't know anything, yeah. they, just, they just use your convert status uh, to, 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 to imply that you are an authority yeah. and that you converted because you are wise and that you have so many great things to Somehow, say about it. It's because, <laughs> because because I chose that voluntarily, it makes me that great. I don't know yeah. why it was so, so weird, but um, <laughs> so yeah, you have many things that like it's it's exciting at first, and then also you're given all these books about like um, women in Islam and all the women's rights in Islam. So you're just like bombarded with like you know now you're free. You're men will look at your face instead of your body and then they won't objectify you anymore um all, it's just so many things that you just tell yourself all the time that's the whole purpose of the fucking thing is because you are being objectified <laughs> i know it's, but it, you know honestly when you're just repeating the, the things to yourself it's just how it is it's so funny like now when you look at it <laughs> but uh Again, and then, but when you're living here, it's different. Now, if I would be in a Muslim country, you see how hijabis are actually really disrespected by men. Like, they're treated like garbage. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Like, I work um, in an office, and there's Muslims, and they were they told me that if I had been a hijabi as a receptionist, I would be disrespected by the Muslims that come in instead of not wearing hijab. But you'd think as a Muslim woman putting it on, now people are gonna honor you and respect you more. It's like not. But those are just Men cover slogans. I mean, th there is a, um, sorry, Yasmin, I didn't. No, I was just gonna say that men being brought up in to, to think of a woman as lesser than, it doesn't matter if she's covered or not covered, that you're still gonna be disrespected. He's still gonna see you as subordinate, subservient, right. lesser than. But the difference is, is when you are wearing hijab, he will see her as part of his group or part of his community or, you know, someone who could possibly he could get in trouble for being flirty with or something. But he'll see you as someone who it's safe for him to, you know, maybe 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 he has a chance with you. Right. All so right. he's going to try and be nice to you and, and be polite to you and, and something could come of it. But there is a reverence of, of just white skin in general. I mean, it's in the religion. <clears throat> so even, even white slaves cost more than black slaves. And when the sex, slavery, hmm? when the sex slavery was going on, it was all about white meat. It was all about white women. Uh, that's why women, um, yeah, so you'll see this in the paintings, right? Like where when they have the history of this, when they talk about the Hodorayin, the um, the sex slaves, essentially, oh, right. they have the white skin. They have skin right. so light you can see their veins, right? Yeah, the somehow that's like attractive. That's the, that's the level of beauty. So. So uh, in the Ottoman hard. Empire, we had this thing. Um, still, until the, until the the, the early nineteen uh, hundreds, in the Ottoman Empire in Turkey, the, in, in the middle of Istanbul, there was still a huge uh, slave trade going on, and uh, the women that were bought and sold there, the most valuable of the of the women that you could buy on that market, were white women who were uh, Caucasian and or European women. There was that was a known thing. Like a white woman was the most valuable thing. That was like white meat, you know. I mean, this was literally what my family told me. So my grandmother is Turkish. My family is Egyptian, Sudanese, like, you know, all sorts of different African mixes in there. And when my, because my family were like of a upper, you know, high class family, my mom's great uncle was the first president of Egypt. So her 
dad had the opportunity to marry whoever he wanted. So of course, what does he want? He wants a white woman. And the white women that were available, Muslim, as we are Muslim, of course. So that's why he got a woman from Turkey who didn't even speak the same language as him. The poor woman came into Egypt and just like you, had child after child after child after child, seven children. He also married two other women. Wow. <laughs> like, you know, treated yeah. her like garbage, brought her out of the country that she was born and raised in into a country where she knew nobody and didn't speak the language. But the thing is, is she was an item. She was a commodity. She was a thing of value because she had white skin and he could bring her in and have her like as his trophy in a country where all most of the women had much darker skin. And have lighter skinned offspring with her as well. Exactly. Yeah. But not that they even really care about the offspring part. Oh. <laughs> they just they just really care about like the the trophy wife. Yeah. Wow. I, I um Regarding the value of women, uh, as you uh, since you brought it up uh, early about how when you are covered up and when you are a Muslim woman, you are actually more valued, to, and how uh, Islam holds women in very high regard. Yeah. I find it very funny. I, I keep remembering the the farewell sermon, which Muslims love to so often uh, mention, and. Uh, well, what they do is, especially in more moderate Muslim cultures, especially if they talk to Western people, there are certain uh, versions of the farewell of the farewell sermon, and uh, some are less authentic than others. And in the most popular versions, uh, Muhammad actually says, and these are and, and these words are often left out by, by 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 Muslims who love to mention how beautiful the farewell, farewell sermon was. But uh, Muhammad actually says in that that uh, that women are um, given to, me, to to men as captives by 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 Allah mm -hmm. uh, they usually choose a little bit more more appealing words when they translate that to 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 modern languages and it says that um, it's a possession essentially yeah as, as, a, as a possession uh, as a temporary possession uh, on on earth uh, men are allowed to have sex with them and uh, and the women are supposed to keep their house safe from the people that men don't want in the house that is their obligation uh, and, and that's a man's right over the woman you know to yeah. all to have her to be in possession of her to have sex with her and to have her keep people out that meant that the man doesn't want in the house the woman's right here over the man is that he feeds her and gives her clothes. That's what the thing say, what the hadith says. Like so, a puppy. Yeah. My, yeah. yeah, my ex brought that up many times of uh, his obligations to me, food and clothing. So th that is really, that is the value yeah. of women For in Islam. not providing uh, yeah. properly. It was, uh, you have a roof over your head and you have clothing, so. Literally a, like, a, like a dog. Yeah. yeah. He, he has fed you and keeps a roof over your head. So oh, that's yeah. it. just corner and sleep in your on your mat the thing that i've noticed is basically no matter how uh non-religious muslims are um even when i have friends that marry uh muslims that don't practice but they still marry them they still do the mahar where they give a dowry so you're basically naming a price for him to purchase you and i just you see just that dynamic he doesn't like, purchase you from you he that, you that relationship is well. now kind of shifted to that, where the man is owning you now and he tells you what to do. And it's just, I don't, it's weird how you see it happening and they just get stuck in it. I don't know. Yeah. 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 Um, I want to go back to the hijab thing that you mentioned too, because you were saying that you felt that um, men were treating you differently when you are wearing hijab versus not wearing hijab. Talk to me about when you were wearing hijab and how pious you felt and how you felt, I'm assuming you felt superior to other women that did not wear hijab. You felt like a more pious person. Yeah, yeah. You, so you you now see, you know, people as Muslim and non-Muslim. So kufar and now you're part of this ummah, which is the family of Islam. So now you're part of this new family. Um, and so the more, mostly the judgment was Muslims that wasn't wearing the hijab. It's like, you know better and, you know, you're not doing it. So it was non-Muslims, you know, they're, they're not guided by Allah, right? Because I was so honored that Allah guided me too, to this great, <clears throat> real intellectual Islam that made more sense. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, for so sure. You just now see the world in that way. 
Yeah. But the slut shaming of other hijabi women was a constant, right? Yes. Like it was. Yeah. Oh, and if I didn't have any friends that like didn't wear the proper hijab and like, even if they wore pants, if I wasn't correcting them every time I saw them, I wasn't allowed to do anything yeah. with them. It yeah. was like, you'll be raised on the day of judgment with those that you sat with, right? There's that hadith. So mm -hmm. it was very, I watched, oh, I had a friend who wore pants. She was my next door neighbor. We were great friends. And I was uh, always getting in trouble because I never brought it up to her or tried to correct her. And uh, he did it in front of me to her. And it was like the most mortifying situation I was ever like part of where he was like reprimanding my friend in front of me because I didn't do it. Like, cause I failed to do it. It was just so awkward. Man. Did you have another question, um, Ridvan? I feel like I keep on asking all of them. No, I, I feel like, um, I, th I think this is more in, um, in the, uh, I have some questions on, on how this all ended, but I guess you're, you're going on with more questions okay. right now, so. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, um, so tell me about the process for you. So you did mention that you're part of a polygamous relationship. Mm -hmm. So now talk to me about the marriage. So now you're married, you're wearing hijab, you are, you know, you've you've drank the Kool Aid essentially. Yeah. You're yeah. totally on board with the idea of the caliphate. Mm -hmm. um, when does when do the doubts start to creep in? Does it have something to do with him I taking on? To ask that. Yeah. yeah. Um, it it was. Uh... Tell me how that conversation went. How did the conversation go for him to tell you, "Hey, Deb." <laughs> and Nira. I was oh yeah, that's great. Right. Hey, Munira, uh, I want to marry another woman as well as you. You cool so with that? That started right after we got married. Oh wow! I need to know that I plan on having more than one wife because that's what the prophet did, and you know, just have that in your mind. And if you have any objections to that, there's something wrong with the way you're thinking because mm -hmm. you're not pious. Like you're not religious enough like if you don't Cheerful. accept god's rules like literally you're not accepting god you're not accepting islam so i had to just yeah i guess and i studied it to the point where i had to embrace it like okay so you know i watched sister wives i watched all the sister wives to pump myself up to like okay i can be friends i'm gonna try to like do it you know the, you know and reading the stories about the wives of the prophet like some of them were friends and oh they got jealous of each other so it's okay to have jealousy and you know you just do these things and when it actually came down to where he um found somebody to marry and it was going to happen in a week um i it, it was so funny because you tell you but so you're so you're now you're praying every time you feel uh, an emotion you're you're praying for help um, you can't really go to people because now you don't know if you're talking bad about your husband. Um, so you already have kids at this point, right? Yeah, you have kids right. uh, under the age of four <laughs> at this point, and um, so yeah, I just really tried to be religious, and I found the most religious friend of mine that I can go stay with when he went and had a honeymoon and stuff. And I just kind of, it, it, I got busy with the kids and then I felt like you can see, you can, you, you can see yourself go through these horrible emotions, but you're just telling yourself, oh, you know, I have to just do this. Just to deny it. Did you still and, love him at this point? Like, did you feel like you were being betrayed? I was very devastated when it happened. And I think I started hating him after that point. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, because by the end of the marriage, I had no respect anymore for him. I was, it was just like, I would just, insults would come out of my mouth without even, like, it was just really bad. Mm -hmm. And so um, it was Your parents never knew about the second marriage. Sorry, no. So and I wasn't allowed to talk to anybody. So I, I could talk to Muslims about it, but not my parents. And my parents lived nearby and I'm, they're involved with my kids. So I literally was making up a second life now. So 
making up reasons why we're doing this or who's this other woman and kids like oh that's my friend and we're hanging out and um my sorry I have to ask you some logistical questions she didn't live in the same house with you did she no she lived um on the same street okay god and his, his kids they were his kids so they're your half your kids half siblings right yeah so they're yeah so I now was staying to keep things together for the kids' sake. Um, Cause I mean, I know if I had broken down and tried to break up, it would be a disaster, especially with like toddlers. So I just did my best to stay. Um, and so my only friend ended up would be her. And so her and I, you know, uh, r raised our kids together and, um, so I, I want to go back a little bit. I want to, um, how, how did this, I mean, I want to understand the psychology behind this, but how exactly did this gradually come into existence? When, before you came together with him, before you married him, did you, did he tell you and did you believe that he would eventually marry another wife? Yeah, so him, I didn't, again, I didn't think he would actually go through with it. Again, because I had met a bunch of Muslims and nobody I knew was in it. Again, nobody talks about it. Um, and nobody in the hizab does it. So I thought, ah, they don't seem to do that. So it was another thing that, um, he, and every time it would become a real discussion, the reality of it seemed to scare him away, which happens to a lot of men. Like I, most Muslim men like joke about it to their wives or uh, threaten them all the time with it. But like really when it comes down to the real, meat and potatoes of it like it's not easy to have two wives two households two families and like it's not Just easy the finances to alone would be a nightmare everything i mean we lived fully off of social assistance and everything so it was just that's our risk right <laughs> no matter where it comes from yeah so it is is like your uh like what god is giving you yeah what's your what's the English translation for for that sustenance yeah like yeah, like God, like Allah's providing for you. Yeah. Allah's providing you for you through the taxpayers of through the Canadian taxpayers, yeah. essentially. Right. And I should say that that's quite a common thing too. Is that men will in Canada? It's very common um, that the man will go on social assistance, and each one of his wives will go on as well as single mothers. You know, he might be legally married to one of them, but the others he's not legally married to. So they collect as single mothers. So usually the financial aspect of having more than one wife is the deterrent because a man has to make enough money to sustain two households or three or four. But in Canada, it's not a problem. The Canadian taxpayers take care of that for you. They yeah. will support your wives yeah. and your children that you are raising yeah. to, <laughs> to hate the West and to eventually establish a caliphate to overthrow all non-Muslims. Mm -hmm. Oh, I know families in Germany. Like, <laughs> I know families in Germany that were monogamous, so they didn't have multiple wives. But uh, but the man was the man was unemployed; he wouldn't work, and they would uh, make so many children because in Germany they receive uh, money from the, from the from the state per child. And, mm -hmm. and the and the idea is, uh, if we make more children, that is good for for Islam because we are advancing the Islamic community by population, mm -hmm. and right. we are also uh, finding the means to, to to survive while we are on our mission to spread. Islam here in these lands so exactly it, it works in many ways yeah wow. and and just um the separation again between uh us as the Muslims and this country that separation so you know the whole like takia is that where you're allowed to lie to non-Muslims so and then you're allowed to steal from non-Muslims so I knew some people that would like literally steal like criminals but because it's like a Kafir government yeah, it, it doesn't matter it's all fine it's, yeah. you know so and then um, not paying car insurance because that contract is invalid in Islam so they just get around these laws and just yeah that was a common thing for everything. It was like, oh, but it's not Islamic, so it doesn't matter. Oh, yeah. we don't have to. Don't have to do Allah is my insurance. That's what they say. Yeah. yeah. So your relationship with your family at this point was 
how should we, how would you describe it? Like with um, your, I mean, I still maintained it with them and I still wanted my kids to go there. Um, it started getting weird because my kids were getting older and now we had to teach my kids to lie to my parents. And now that was very hard because it's like, you know, this is wrong. So grandma and grandpa think this is wrong what we're doing. So now we're now, it was so complicated. And uh, so my mom would come to me and say like, you know, they're saying that they're keeping a secret. <laughs> like they would literally say stuff like that because they're kids, right? Mm -hmm. And then I would always just be making up stories about what's actually going on. Always making up stories. So it was just, there was no, it was just like two existences almost at that point. Were you taught to think of your parents as the other, as Kufar, as the, the, the enemy essentially? Mm, yeah, and but we depended on them so much. I mean, there uh, were points, I mean, when you have like low finances and you're depending on parents for child care and we didn't uh, send the kids to school because um, homeschooling is more Islamic, right? So you're segregating everybody. So they helped so much with uh, everything. I, I mean, our hydro got cut off all the time. So my parents would come and bail us out all the time. And it's just, uh, you know, all these reminders that this life is short and we have to be here as a traveler. You know, all any complaints about the way we were living was just looked at like, you know, think about the people in Syria. Like we have it so good here. What are you complaining about? Um, yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, it was just like a real breakdown, especially with the separation from the family like that. And um, now, um, and then uh, I now had a disabled child and I, she, my co-wife started having children. I got pregnant again. So now I was pregnant, she was pregnant, uh, disabled. Uh, I can't sleep anymore. And if I'm upset about the disability, I am such a bad Muslim for not being thankful to Allah for giving me this uh, plight, I guess. So there's just nothing but guilt for feeling bad about my situation. Uh, again, that's a way of staying in it. Um, and how do you get yourself out of that? When oh, nobody did. really even knows what's happening to you when you've been lying to them the whole time and defending it the whole time. So I, you feel ashamed. It's like, you, I made my bed, I got it's embarrassing with it, right? Like, so How did it start falling apart? I mean, when did you, um, how, how did you start? I mean, what, was it first that you were upset about things and then uh, you proceeded to doubting things and being against it or how, how did that so Islam was the very last thing to go. So it was mainly just, um, the last year, um, he didn't stay with me anymore. Like he just, um, so be, not being around me a lot, gave me a lot more time to see my situation. And not only that, because I had a disabled child, I was out uh, doing a lot of doctor and therapy and stuff. So I was, again, like directing mm -hmm. in the house is so easy. So now when you're out in the world doing everything every day yourself, now you can't, you can't separate those worlds anymore. So that's where like little doubts and the stress of being a hijabi amongst this was that just threw on so much extra, extra anxiety um, for everything. The way people looked at me, um, I'm sure I misread everything. I was just so stressed out every time I didn't even want to go anywhere. Like it's just. You know, Did you feel at that point that you were getting a support that there were non-Muslims, they were supporting you with your disabled child and did it make you start to feel like maybe these people don't hate me as much as I've been led to believe? More like they're they're still on our team and, and, and they're look, like they're helping our son and they're helping us, you know, uh it's just be tolerant of our shenanigans because, you know, Muslims like make everything yeah. more difficult. Like you go to a restaurant, like, okay, do you pork, uh, do you cook pork on the same thing as you cook that? And if you do this and that, and like, I don't, just forget it. Like, I'm not going to go. It's just, so <laughs> I started again, having more relationships with non-Muslims and depending on them a bit more. 
And um, it got to a point where I was left alone with all the, the kids and um, they- Including kids from her? Yeah, because they went um, traveling to a bunch of countries to find a place for us all to move. And so I complained, I, I said no when they were planning this trip and I complained about it and they were like, you know, you're fine. Like, you'll be fine. Like, you know, you can take care of like so many kids. Uh, we'll get sisters to come and help in the community. And I mean, I told I told them I was already broke, breaking down. I was really broken down by that point. I tried to reach out to a couple of sisters. I, I didn't even know how to ask for help. I'm just like, there's something going on. I don't know how to get help. And they would just give me a heck and say, you're stupid. You're stupid for it. Make you're so stupid to let them do this to you. I just got in shit. Like, mm -hmm. <clears throat> You're so dumb for letting them yeah, make that's, this. You know, it was just so then were those I, Arab know, women? I need to know. Those were Arab women that were telling you you're being stupid. Oh, yeah. I, I got in heck big time. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, oh my gosh. Yeah. It's just then it, um, when my, my children started not being comfortable either. When I started seeing that same thing in them, that's when I said, okay, I can't. Not only that, seeing, like, imagining my children getting involved in a marriage like this mm -hmm. in the future, I, I couldn't even imagine. So I had to figure out a way to get out. And I did it by first emailing them while they were on the trip and saying, it's over, go to that house. I'm gonna put everything there. Um, and I didn't say it's over that I wanted a divorce. I said, something has to change. Leave me alone for about a month or two. Just leave me alone so I can sort out myself. And, um, of course they didn't allow that. And when he came back, um, he didn't leave me alone, like ever. It was just, the more you leave me alone, the more I can think for myself. So, mm -hmm. um, it was it was really scary like he would corner me or he would trap me and get me in the car and then take me for a drive and just lay it on me like what like what are you doing like you're you're gonna like destroy the family like you're so it was very confusing at that point about what to do um i finally um sorry i'm trying to think what happened uh he they called me told me she was pregnant again and wanted me to drive her to the doctor or something and then um he he came along and cornered me and told me that from now on i'm not allowed to leave the house without his permission and uh so now he's gonna like really lay it down because that was it like i had been too unruly i guess up until that point and um, and I said, well, what if you're not at my house? Like, what, you know, how do I leave? And he was like, well, then you don't leave until, you know, until I tell you. Um, and then, so that's when I planned. I said, I'm going to get my kids. So I'm going to go to my parents' house, make a reason why I'm going to go there for the night with the kids. And so I just stayed. And there was many problems after that. But that was when it finally happened and I, so you had to share with but i parents. never meant to leave islam that was not ever my thing ever it was just trying to extract myself out of this really mess that i made and i didn't know how to think anymore it was weird it's really that's this is why i talk about hijab so often is because you're trying to free yourself so you you they left you with all of these children that are homeschooled and you no, know, so you're completely 24 seven with like basically a gaggle of children stuck in the house. Then he comes back and there's more pressure on you. And now it's the, you know, the iron bars are gonna come down even harder. And it's just pressure after pressure after pressure. And at this point, you just want some oxygen. You just want some freedom, step by step. You want that freedom to be released bit by bit. Yeah. And as, as you take those steps, Eventually, if you're looking for your freedom, you will end up stepping into the zone that says you need to leave Islam because if you're looking for freedom, you're not going to find it here. 
Well, I found that every single problem I had and every rule that was enforced on me was in the name of Islam. So how do you separate yourself from it if it's not the religion? I went through the exact same thing. Yeah. And this is why when I talk about hijab, it's like it's the physical shackles. You yeah. know, like there are, people think I was just a cloth on the head. But no, it's such a it's a step. Yeah. It's. Just, I'm not asking women to leave Islam. I'm asking them to find their freedom and to do what they want to do. If they want to wear it, that's their business. They can wear it. They can stay indoctrinated. And But if they don't want to wear it and they want to take it off, yeah. then I want to support them in that because I know that that is letting them take steps towards their freedom and towards right. their happiness. Right. And once you remove the just the physical thing that is constricting you, then your mind will be next to follow. So that's kind of where you were at. You needed to get yourself and your children in a safe place first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's going to take a while before you start to, uh, you know, to release your mind from the shackles. But first right. of all, you need to get your physical body and your children's physical bodies free. Yeah. It's well, that and that, well, from my parents, we ended up having to stay in a women's shelter for a month because there's no way he would have let that happen. He was threatening and now there was a restraining order. Because he knew where you were. Yeah. And no, and he was threatening, like, take the kids. Because, I mean, Islamically, the kids go to the husband, right? So if I'm trying to leave the marriage, then you go alone and get out yeah. of here. I don't want to ever see you again. You're corrupt. Um, and that's one of the many, many things that keeps women in these abusive relationships is yeah. if you leave, you leave your children behind. Yeah. I was absolutely terrified. I had changed my daughter's name and changed my name. And even just the thought of it, just knowing when I, all everything that I did, just looking behind my back until she was 18, honestly, yeah. until I knew that she was gonna be old enough to be able to find her way back home and to get away. But I was so scared that he was gonna come and kidnap her from me. More than I was afraid he was gonna come and kill me. I was afraid that he was going to come and kidnap her from me because he wouldn't want, he, it's his, right? You know how they are about their possessions, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. And that's the thing. And that's what scares me too. It's like, he, they're never going to stop. Like that's, yeah. you know, and if the kids are with me, like they're going to help. So yes, yes. Cause you're going to raise them. So he not just the kids. So that's the battle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just, just a quick question. Uh, you don't have to answer it. It's not. It's maybe it's not relevant. Maybe it's misplaced. But um, ob obviously, you were um, threatened. You were not allowed to leave after that stage. But uh, how was it before? Was it? Uh, did you experience uh, violence or anything of that sort? He never hit before? me. It was all just verbal. Um, mm -hmm. There was lots of lectures. Um, he, he just. That's just how it is. It's, it's like a his way of doing things. Like you. Um, he won't stop talking until he sees that you are fully not just understand it, but now also believe that exact same thing. And he'll ask you the questions and you have to answer it correctly. So, I mean, he caught me with um, my sleeves up because it was so hot uh, one time. And it was like two days of lectures from like, there's something wrong with me that I, really thought it was okay to expose my nudity outside nudity. so what happened that you saw that that way that that was okay it was just really so 12 years of that and every time he would say my name i cringed and i even mentioned it to him i thought it was funny and i'm like why do i cringe when you say my name it's not like you're gonna hit me or something i thought it was just i looked at my my physical reactions to things a lot as amusing because my physical body reacted uh, the opposite as to what your Islam was supposed to accept things and the way you're supposed to see things. So it's more of just like training yourself to, again, like you said, with the more you suffer, the better it is. So you actually feel good to suffer. The it's also, you know, like women in full niqab, it's like, wow, just think of hellfire and how hot that would be. So you oh. feel good in the niqab. Like, I heard that so many times. Even I heard that. So. <laughs> Did you ever have to wear the niqab? I did it for one month, uh, for Ramadan one time, uh, to try it. Um, and I had panic attacks with it. I, I am so, I, and especially you have all these kids. So there was a couple times I'd be out in public 
trying to do things that I would like rip it off my face because I was like, I couldn't breathe now. And I don't know how these women do that. <laughs> but I was, uh, I tried, I was trying to be more pious. I guess I, mm -hmm. you know. How, uh, so you still, you, uh, just quickly, just to uh, off topic, uh, you mentioned your name. Um, we didn't really go into that at the beginning, but I'm just uh, out of curiosity. You changed your name when you converted to Islam. Right. Uh, to Munira, you said? Yeah. How, how did that come? What was the sentiment behind it? Uh, um, so after I converted and then um, around all these other converts, I also met a lot of other converts and they all had changed their name to a Muslim name. So it's a way of like really setting a new identity. Um, so having a whole new name, new identity. I did um, start having an identity crisis about five years in though, because I didn't know what name to use anymore. It was like, what do I do? I panicked for about a week. And then I thought, oh, I'll just use both. So then now I was starting to have two <laughs> identities. I guess it like slowly progresses into this strange thing. Did you choose the name Manira for yourself? Yeah, I chose it. I just looked at a bunch of names and and my husband helped me pick one. It's just something. Yeah. Was it based yeah. on the meaning or just the sound of it or? It sounds nice. It wasn't <laughs> too hard to say. Okay. Spell. I don't know. <sighs> so I know this woman who converted when she married this man and she changed her name to Sophia. So Sophia, because of the story, I don't know if you know about this story of, uh, you do know the story. The Jewish of one? The tribe of Jewish yeah. people, yeah, where he killed all the men. And for the boys, if they didn't have pubic hair, he took them as soldiers. And if they did have pubic hair, then they got killed with the men as well. And all of the women and girls got taken as sex slaves. And he chose Sophia after he had just killed her father and her husband that day. He chose, actually, he didn't even, she was taken by somebody else first yes. as, as a sex slave. And then he was like, no, I want that one. And he took her as his sex slave. And um, and then she fell in love with him. Of course. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's like, he's so, so married like her. And, and she became his wife. So she was no longer a sex slave. So my friend, uh, who was converting to Islam chose that name because to her that was a story of somebody converting from Judaism to Islam because they she, loved the Prophet Muhammad. Yeah. So. Yeah. Small, small correction, by the way. He didn't even. Uh, he didn't even. Um, so he uh, he took the slaves, and then uh, one companion came and said, "I want a slave," and he said, "Just go and pick one." So he picked Sophia, and then someone else came and said, uh, "Oh, prophet, that woman is very important because oh. she's the daughter of this and this." And then they said, uh, "You should take her, not him." And then he was like, "Oh yeah, good idea." And then he give went her back. And, yeah, give her back yeah. to me. So. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. I yeah. really uh, met a sister um, who was a sex slave for about three or four years before he married her. Um, like she was Yazidi or something? No, here she converted to Islam through this guy and he took her as a concubine and proved to her that that's a real legit thing. He kept her in a house. Okay, so you're talking about like the rape gangs in the UK or no. are you talking about in Canada? Here, somebody I personally know where I live here. I didn't he know that this was a sex was. slave because he told her that because he got her to con convert to Islam that now she's his sex slave. She came to me for help uh, several years ago because um, she thought that because my ex was so like Islamist that her slave owner, I guess, would listen to him because he had two wives and stuff. And so when when we found out about this, my ex was like, wow, you can't do that in, in here. And so he tried to correct him and that caused like having to get restraining orders because like, you know, these two crazies fighting each other. Um, and she ended up going back to him. And now I still see her on social media. She has like a bunch of kids now with him and it's just, like, Oh my God. I see her sometimes walking 10 feet behind him in the car, oh like oh every God. time. It's really bad. How do you do that to yourself? I mean, I want to clarify, um, 
it, it is it is not islamically the right way to you know for a woman to convert and then become a, a, a convert can't. Or sex you slave. can't muslims can't be slaves yeah, no, yeah. yeah. This guy's also a convert and he's not right like that's what he's the, doing. the thing is this is something that islam creates basically even though it is not appropriate under islam this is the mentality the sentiments that islam creates exactly so, so it's you can literally take these kind of things and and yeah do it in the name of islam yeah. Because that's what separates a Muslim from a non-Muslim. Well, one of the many things. But like that's for women, for example, that's why the hijab, you know, signifies this is a Muslim woman. She's <clears throat> taken. She's protected. You can't rape her. Right. But these ones that are not covered. In fact, they weren't allowed to be covered. Mm -hmm. They had to be uncovered because they were free game. And the, so I'm not saying that Muslims, Islam doesn't allow sex slavery because, of course, it does, mm -hmm. but it doesn't allow sex slavery of Muslim women. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so the well, concept is uh, that's why my ex was correcting him because he did it wrong. He's like, no, 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 you got to take a non Muslim. Yeah, 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 like you can't. <laughs> So you can you can you can enslave people through uh, through war, or you can buy them from the market, and they have to be uh, they have to be non-Muslims if you enslave them. So only non-Muslims can be enslaved. Afterwards, they can convert to Islam, and then, then you, have have to, to, yeah, you have the option to yeah, you have to you have the option to free them uh, or to to marry them. Or yes. well, if this person sees our video, he might comment and give us the evidence for this. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> disgusting conversation. <laughs> How does it? I just want to ask both of you, actually, because um, I, I I feel like I, I often want to repeat this question to to people, especially to people who, is, who experienced uh, Islam deeply and who are women. Um, how does it feel? I mean, in what kind of mindset are you when you are really religious and you really accept uh, ex accept accept this religious system, these religious beliefs and morals? How does it feel? The concept that I mean, to accept that your husband or your potential husband uh, is allowed to not only have more women, but also to have uh, concubines, sex slaves, and that he will receive uh, superior women, uh, virgins in paradise. So yeah, that's his, beautiful. How, that's how his do you reward. feel about it? I asked, I asked that. I'm like, so how are women supposed to even care about Jenna if your husband is off with all these women and stuff? And he's like, well, there's a hadith that says that the, your wife will be even more beautiful than the Huri. <laughs> okay. So that's supposed to make us feel better. Not only that, there's like hadith saying that young boys will feed us off of our fruit and stuff like that in Jannah. And we'll be sitting by rivers of wine or something. Yeah, like, they're just they're just wine. servants. They're just so servants. we're gonna have young children feeding us while our men are all with. Oh, them. Well, okay. Well, then in that case. That oh, yeah. it. Yeah. That oh, and, it. An, and an orgasm lasts like a hundred years. <laughs> so, like, how amazing is that? Like, wow. Yeah, I'm pretty sure these are not Sahih hadith. <laughs> no, <laughs> pretty pretty many hadith, so. <laughs> Do you know an orgasm lasts? Oh, 100 years well in <laughs> terms. Okay. That's really tiring. <laughs> That's like your whole motivation to do this, man. The concept of, of, of the hijab, by the way. At that point. Yeah. <laughs> right after 50 years, you'd be like, okay, enough. Yeah, like, I'm done. <laughs> Not to guys, though. Guy thing. That guy has obviously made up these rules. Like, what? It's just ridiculous. So obvious. Absolutely ridiculous. All of it is so stupid. And we it even is, have Sahih Hadith that say uh, Muhammad had the sexual strength of thirty men, and I think about it, it's like no man wants to have that. It's like it's uh, that that's that's stupid. Like yeah. that there is nothing good about it. There's nothing comfortable about that. What? It's, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's that, like constant are, Viagra. It's yeah. the ones that are very sexually frustrated, though, that yeah. would talk right. like this, right? right. The messed up ones. Yeah. So yeah. they're the ones making all. And they're the ones that are getting attracted to the seventy-two virgins and all right. the other bullshit too, right? I don't Islam know. Islam makes you that way, though. Did you always yeah. see pictures? It separates women completely from you, and then says, "If you want them, here, dangle, dangle. You're going to have to go to heaven for it." Yeah, absolutely, definitely. excellent. That's why. That's why Islam, Muslim men are of, of uh, people who had died martyrs, where they have a smile on their face. List. All the virgins are around. Yes. 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 Like, yeah. oh, look, that guy has all the virgins right now. God, holy! There was a I can't. I God, I could remember. Maybe you remember with on. It was very recently where a, a suicide bomber had gone wrong, but he had with him a list of all the the different 
women that he was going to have sex with when he went to heaven. Like he had what? it all out. Like I want like a redhead with big boobs. Oh and <laughs> my god! Yeah, yeah. I guess. I mean, I was told like you know how you're told like with praying to Allah for any like you're told to pray for everything. Yeah. It's like you should pray for anything, like a car, like your, anything, even materialistic. So, but like God always answers it, right? Mm -hmm. Three ways. Either you get what you ask for or he, pre you don't get what you ask for, but he prevents you from getting harmed. Mm -hmm. Or you don't get what you ask for now, but you'll get it in Jannah. So it's like, that's the one that how everything's usually. getting answered. Yep. So this it's is so weird. I mean, I mean, I was, um, I, I was also taught. I was very religious, and I was also taught, obviously, from very uh, early childhood, that I sh that I would receive these uh, these virgins in heaven, and I would uh, have a lot of sex with them, and endless sex, so much sex, lot of lots of sex. And um, I know when I was religious, I, since I grew up with a very Western mindset, actually, because uh, I was first influenced by by the environment in Germany before I was influenced by religiosity, and before be before I fell in love with religiosity. But afterward, I became religious. And growing up with that German mindset where we are all uh, equal and we are all friends and colleagues, uh, after after I became religious, I still thought, okay, I love this and I love Allah and I want to go to heaven and all that, but uh, maybe it is up to me whether I really want to have virgins in heaven or not because it doesn't really sound very, it doesn't really align very much with my with my worldview and with my values. But then, I, but then uh, I mentioned this to somebody and 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 and, and they said, well. Um, it can't be that you are more moral than Allah, and mm -hmm. Allah promises virgins to you. So that basically implies that I am the that I am uh, kind of sexually that I'm kind of perverted. I'm 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 so wrong. Some, yeah, you're you're the deviant. Yeah, yeah. I'm, that's I'm always deviant. what it is. That's always what it is. Like with Deb, when they were saying, if you have a problem with him marrying another woman, it's yeah. your fault. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. I was young, and I'd say, how can we revere a man that raped a nine-year-old girl? Now that's my fault for asking that question. You know, mm -hmm. I should. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it, it it's something that, you know, is so wonderful. And if I can't see that, then that's a fault in True. me. Yeah, I watched some people, like, try to explain that part. Not only that, the whole thing about, like, oh, it was a different time. Uh, people always got married that age back then. And mature faster in the desert. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, there's always that. So what was the point of, of doubt? You said that it was, Islam was the last thing to go. Do you remember? what it was that made you say actually i'm going to question my allegiance it, to this religion. it happened uh my ex put in the court papers that i had publicly denounced islam and i read that and i'm like i haven't said anything about islam but i guess because i'm not in hijab that's me publicly. and then i started to be like wow he's saying that that means that i'm an apostate oh so then I started going through that. Then I really started looking. And that's when I started looking. And he made it a possibility almost. He made me fully like look and reject it completely. Wow. Like it's just, it was that. And like, well, now I'm publicly denouncing him to Islam. So he actually mom, ruined your afterlife, basically. You <laughs> now you're gonna burn yeah. in hell to the head. <laughs> My mom would do that to me too. She'd be like, I know you're sleeping with him. I'm like, is that an option? Like I, I never, how, how is that even like, I've never even held his hand, you know, yeah. but they assume the absolute worst all the time. But um, so you were saying that he wrote this in the court papers, just curious, why would that be of any relevance? Like if you're in Saudi Arabia, it'd be important to say, oh, she's not uh, well, religion. Because in court, in the courts here, uh, if you're, Basically, I found anytime I brought up stuff about religion, they kind of cringe. Like, they don't want to. So I think he was trying to bring religion into it more than anything. Uh, uh -huh. I, that's how I analyzed it. I don't know. Right, right. Or right. everything was just. They, they don't want to intervene that. when it's a religious matter. So they just want to, you know, leave it to the people, I guess. Yeah, I don't know. I wonder um, if, um, if it's going to come out now, if he's going to get in trouble for breaking the law because polygamy is against the law in Canada. No, I have spoken to every kind of person that could possibly prosecute for that. And there's, he wasn't legally married to either of us. So. Um, which means it doesn't matter that he, that that actually happened. That's what I'm saying. Like, what if, 
everybody did that. Like you could have four wives right. not legally married to any of them. How did so more people people married, 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 married to either of you marry any more than yeah. one? Anyways, so okay, um, and what about Deborah. the fraud of collecting? Sorry, Bridvan. Yeah, again, I don't know. I don't know if how I could get. I guess they could investigate to see if there's fraudulent earnings, but. Anyway, you weren't married, so this is going to be a hard one. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. Deborah, how long, um, so to, to recap that, I just want to ask you a question. Uh, how long were you married in total to him? 12 years. 12 years. And uh, I want to ask this, um, in, in those 12 years, when did you ever start to regret something? Did you ever, like, did you have little regrets from the very beginning that you started to suppress? You know oh. what I mean? Like. Yes, I suppressed tons of red flags initially. It was because I got pregnant and now, and it was like, I mean, it was the first time I had gotten pregnant ever. So, and now it was just when you're told, like when you practice Islam and you're trying to go like, you know, as full practicing as you can, red flags and things that would normally alert you to things like you're not supposed to regard those things anyway. Like if Allah's guiding you to something or telling you what you should or shouldn't do, then that's what's good for you. Like it doesn't matter what you think or don't think. So yeah, there was a lot of red flags, like obviously with um, just behaviors and just even the... I guess the organization, again, I would just tell myself because it's nonviolent, it was just very easy to brush away that it's fine, you know. Did he hit the children, though? Or because I remember you were saying that you're related to the first chapter of my book with the tying of the feet. Um, no, he didn't do that. But I have uh, quite a few friends that also practice that particular thing. The reason the I same, had... Um, same way. Sorry? In the same way where they same were tying way. the feet tied and hit the feet. Can you describe that for those who don't know? Oh, yeah, I don't know what it is with that type of punishment, hitting kids under the feet with the a stick or mm -hmm. something. It's extremely painful and it's like a form of torture. I remember first, and like not just kids, like toddlers, like one-year-olds, two-year-olds, like would get it. I don't know, is it because it doesn't show or... Um, yeah, it feels like really a form of torture, in my opinion. Um, he, you know, he didn't do any physical anything that. That's good. He he was too cerebral for that. As a kid with the head of the guy, he prided himself on being he's, sexual. He studied um, ways to um, manipulate people in conversations all the time because that's what you're doing. You're convincing people of ideas. So how do you do it? You got to watch his body language and read this and. Um, it's a cult of muscles, basically. As a, as a uh, member, that's what you have to do. So you have to be really good at that. Mm. At manipulating people's psychology, basically, getting them yeah. to believe you have to change, you want them. change how you think, change your concepts about everything. Everything. I found it so interesting when you were talking about your body reacting when your mind was surprised, you know, like how you'd cringe when he'd say your name. Yep. And that's because he is able to fool your mind. You're able to fool your own mind, yep. but your body isn't getting fooled. Right. And well, I had that exact same experience. I was so, I'd never really thought of it that way until you said it, but it was like, you know, that's in every part of Islam where you are forced to overcome your innate human Re responses and your innate human reactions have to be, you know, superseded by this religion, even your love for your own children. Oh, yeah, that, that has thing. to be buried, and the religion comes first. I, my mom would be willing, and not just my mom, so, you know, honor violence and honor killings are so common. People say, How can they do that? How can you kill your own daughter? How can you, you know, in Iran, a man, you know, chopped off, he behead his own daughter. Yeah. And you wonder, how can people do that? Well, it's because of the fact that the religion comes first and even they like their humanity is so buried under there for so long 
under all of these religious edicts. Exactly. It's so hard to find yourself when you come out of this. And it, it, it's, it's weird and scary. Well, it's a form of, um, it's, it's, um, it's, um, it's mental abuse. And um, we are all, we all suppress things. Like when uh, you, you justify to yourself the things that happen and try to explain them as completely normal while, mm -hmm. while, while, while subconsciously you're not really okay with it. You're, you're, you're fighting with it inside. And while you are consciously suppressing what is happening and trying to explain it away, subconsciously you are, you're, you're, you're it, it's, 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 it feels disgusting and it, it feeds an anxiety within you that is always there, but, it, but, but that you don't immediately recognize, yeah. that you don't immediately consciously see, which is why just very little thing, just like hearing your name or hearing him saying your name caused involuntary uh, reactions that are a subconscious anxiety that you have. Oh, yeah. The first time he caught me out in public without my hijab on, he ran to my car and ripped the door open and I literally peed my pants like from out of fear, just the way he looked at me. It was just, I was naked in public, like how dare I? And I don't even remember what the yelling happened. <laughs> I was just shocked that I had peed my pants. Out of fear. So he was angry at you, even though you weren't with him anymore. But as well, no, this was me trying to leave. Um, I had taken uh, my child to therapy, and he knew, and he had met me there, and that's when, like, uh, I ended up having to go to a shelter and everything because uh, that's when the threats and like get away from my kids. Like, look at you naked. Like you're you're corrupt. The kids have to come home, and that's it. And you get out of here. Yeah, and they literally, they use the word naked and they really truly mean it as naked. It is, that's what Allah says is nudity. Like, we have no right to say what nudity is. Like, if Allah says that's nudity, we're literally naked. Like, if I stood in front of a window in my house, just like dressed like this, it was like, are you insane? Like, would you stand outside fully naked and think that's fine? Like, what's wrong? Like, why are you standing in front of the window? Close, like, What's and it's like meanwhile there's nobody outside. Like you can tell there's nobody. I don't know. But as a man, I learned this thing. I um I don't know if you, if 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 any if 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 you two are aware of this. If this is just something that is rather traditional, because I don't remember a source to that. But this is actually something significant that I learned when I was religious, and it was always on my mind. Which is that um, if a woman is uncovered or is not properly covered, and 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 a man looks at that woman, then uh, then the woman takes on the sins of all the men who see her and who look at her. Yes. And, Burn for all of that. Yeah, and, uh, and same with smell. If she yeah. has yeah. any oh, yes. in her hand exactly. or the loud shoes, hears yeah. her voice. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's I was also instructed. It's to, victim blaming, like quintessential. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was instructed to talk to if I answered the phone and it was a man to have an ugly voice. I yes. was instructed to yeah. sound yeah. ugly because I could sound too attractive to these men. Yep. Yep. Oh my God! Women should neither be seen nor heard, right? Yeah. What, what do you What do you want to say to to uh, to women who? And I, Yasmin mentioned it earlier. I receive emails quite often from women who find themselves in a marriage. They ask me what they should do, and I and I just feel like I'm 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 a man. I mean, I talk about Islam, but I don't have the experience to really tell you what you know uh, how to feel and what to do. But and you are here, for example, as a as a living example of someone who converted to Islam, mm -hmm. suffered under it for so long, and is now out. So, what would be your advice? advice to, 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 to number one, to people, to women who want to convert to Islam, who could, who could possibly marry religious Muslim men, and number two, to women who are married to Muslim men and who just want to get out or find comfort again? Oh, um, just that there is a lot more support than you think. You feel like you're completely alone, but if you um, reach out to somebody, um, that can even help you find people. Because even if you're broken down, as, as I was, like, I was like, yes, being, that she mentioned in her book, like, she just, like, ended up at a hospital, like, trying to ask for help. You don't even know what to do. I went to Emerge. I'm, like, suicidal. I don't know. And I can't even tell the truth because he had two wives, so I couldn't even explain the whole story to people, thinking someone's going to get arrested. And um, it's just... 
um, there's, there's help for us and, um, don't feel guilty or ashamed for, um, being in it. I mean, it's such a, it's like any abusive situation. And I guess you just don't see it that way when it's religious. Mm -hmm. Um, it's like a steady slope decline into this madness. And before you know it, you're really stuck in it, especially if you have children and, you've separated yourself from family. A lot of times people really burn bridges with family. So you really have no one to go to. Um, even there's Muslims that will help Muslim women get out of bad marriages because Muslims get upset at these kind of things that I go through. I've had so many Muslims come up to me and, you know, feel horrible that this happened. And, and I'm not saying every Muslim marriage is like this either, because I know a lot of couples that are great. Like they are happy and stuff. It's just, um, I guess if you're in an extreme situation where you're really fundamental and se segregated, um, you feel alone and you're not. There's a lot of people out there that can get you out and your children and help them. So we have a cliche that we say, which is not my Muhammad, because quite often these Western women will be like, not my Muhammad, like he's a sweetheart and he's, he'll never be like that. And he told me he's not even interested in religion and actually we go drinking and you know, whatever. Um, and then of course things turn really sour afterwards. So was that your experience too? Like, was he a different person prior, like when he was courting you versus after you became so it was like no courting really <laughs> but um you you see the shift in these men and um uh, because now they are a husband and possible soon father so i think their fundamentals just come straight back to them i again i i mentioned on twitter recently i had a friend just we were partying with these guys and they're Muslim, Muslim guys and she got pregnant and they decided to get married and move in together and Islamically marry. And he instantly, like from this fun partying guy that's all like years and years to controlling, mean, yelling, abusive, telling you what to wear and where to go and who's your friend. It's just this instant switch like as soon as this weird wedding happens, there's pictures and my friend just like looks so sad. It's like a very sad situation. Um, she's out of it too now, which is great. Like she got out of it. Mm -hmm. I hope. Oh, that's good. I'm glad to hear that. Tabira, um, if you knew or if you encountered a, a woman um, now that you know is uh, talking to a very religious Islamic man, and uh, who is possibly about to get into a serious relationship, uh, into a, a marriage with this man. And uh, you basically know what's about to happen, what's about to change in this person's life. What would be a few things, or what would, what would you want to say to this woman? Good question. I mean, I didn't even prevent my friend from doing it. <clears throat> I am, um, <clears throat> I, I would try to explain what happened to me if they didn't know. Um, <clears throat> I try to explain to people about how just the marriage dynamic shifts ev the relationship and everything, the, the ownership really like, it's taken me a long time to just even realize that your husband is shouldn't be the one letting you do things. <laughs> It's just somehow that's still something I'm shedding out of my, my mind. But yeah, like we're all humans, we're equal. Like it should just be like a friendship, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, mean. No, I just really want to thank you, Deb, for your honesty and for, you know, taking us through all of your trauma and great detail and sharing it <laughs> with us all. And I hope that it has been useful for you to share your story because it can sometimes be really cathartic. I mean, it's not going to maybe feel that way initially. Initially, it just feels really exhausting 
to talk about all this. Um, and I also hope that you will be, you know, a cautionary tale for the women that we were talking about just now. And I hope so. hopefully somebody will walk, click on this and it will at least get her to listen to the red flags that are in her mind. Because like you said, obviously, hashtag not all Muslims, you know, he might be a perfectly wonderful man and you might end up with, you know, all, you know, happy till you both, you know, die together holding hands. But that's a very small percentage of very- yeah. Usually you know, like something happens where they have kids and then he decides to become religious or he goes and does Hajj and that's it. No, he's super oh, religious. Yeah. You know, like something, you, you can't anticipate what's gonna happen. And usually as these guys get older, they become more religious. Not just guys, yeah. any Muslims, they become more religious as they get older. Well, yeah. there's this concept. Even if people are, even if uh, that, that's a that's a thing with many Muslim uh, men, even if they throughout their lives are not religious, they have it in the back of their mind, or they are always taught that uh, once things get serious, so once they actually go and in, get into a a marriage with somebody and start having a child, then they are supposed to uh, to to start being religious at least in a way, or to start uh, fulfilling certain obligations, or even if they're not religious to to tell their wife to you know uh, observe the hijab for example and if yeah. they don't do that then the parents uh, take care of it and so it's, yeah. it's there, there's a lot to that exactly <clears throat> well deborah i i really appreciate uh you sharing your story i i really um i think that was this was this was very enlightening very heartfelt uh I I appreciate it so much. I I see how you are um, strong, how you came out very strong out of this, and mm -hmm. how you stand mm -hmm. your ground. And I'm I'm very I'm very impressed with that. And well, thank uh, you. I, I appreciate your platform. Like honestly, I felt ever since I left, I felt like the need to speak up because it's happening so much and nobody's speaking about it. Like nobody. And again, I was telling Yasmin as well, I was starting to com compile some stories of just women I know personally and uh, try to compile it into like a series of, of stories of what's going on here. Like I've had friends, they escaped to another country to get away from the father of their child trying to steal their child. Like, it's just crazy. I would love to support that actually, if you want to. <laughs> If you, if you want to, to gather such stories, if you want to do anything, I'm always oh, of uh, here course. to yeah, of support course. Such, such a cause. It's, it would be great. Yeah. These stories need to be heard. People, yes. this needs to be out there. People need to know. Because right now, like the example you gave of not without my daughter, like what is that from the 70s? Like we're just, this is that's this all is we have. Knowledge. That's all we have. Yeah. Right. It's, well, it's, it's based it's, on loosely off right. something, but it's, right. yeah. but it's not the same. And, you know, you were talking about how many women you knew that were converts in your community alone, in your little city alone, right? So this is, this is you know, these women need to hear this. They need to know this before they take those steps in that direction. They need to know what they're getting themselves into because they've been lied to. Exactly. Quite often, you're just given some fairy tale, you know, version of the slam and and they don't know what they're actually really in for well, it's all that flowery things you hear religion of peace women are dignified and honored now and um women have all the rights and jenna's all the rights. feet right and um well you know it's good because the man is taking care of you so you don't even have to worry about certain <laughs> things <laughs> it's just you can justify anything that's what i yeah. learned you can yeah. literally just justify anything. I'm, I'm so glad that we have this that we have had this conversation. It's it's been it's been uh, very great. I hope it will help a lot of people. Um, I hope it feels very good for you, Deborah. And yeah, um, I really you. appreciate it. I would love to uh, talk to you again in the future. Maybe sometime. Sure. It's actually you 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 very um, you really um, you knew very well how to how to put this. And I think. Um, oh, thank you. It has been, it has been very important. Thinking a lot about it. <laughs> Uh, is there anything else that uh, you want to you want to add, Deborah? <clears throat> um, no, I think that's all for now. I really appreciate this, you guys. It's Thank really you. nice yeah. to meet you guys and um, be Thank part you. of Thank really you. the insanity on Twitter. That's all new for me, but <laughs> that's where all the action is. So yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But, uh, how we reach people. Yeah. Okay. But I really appreciate you guys are amazing and.
and on behalf of all of us that are watching you all the time, uh, thank you for doing what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, thank you so much then. Thank you, Yasmin. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, Yasmin and I will be here again, uh, hopefully in the near future with uh, other people who also want to share their stories with other uh, survivors, if I may call it so. Um, in fact, if you want to, to participate in this, if you want to tell your side of the story, you can, uh, you can contact Yasmin, you can contact me, you can find us uh, over, over Twitter or down here in the comment section. Thanks so much for watching. I will see you again. Have a fantastic day and stay away from Islam.